Well, good morning. It's good to see you all here. Today is Epiphany, and you're wondering what that word means. It has something to do with God revealing or showing us who He is, some special truth of who God is. And today, being Epiphany Sunday, we're going to look at some of the things that God has revealed to us of who God is and what God is about, and even a little bit about who God has called us to be and what we are to be about as the church. God has not left us alone to grope around and try to figure that out, but God has revealed that. I really like that word, reveal, because it means to pull back something that is hidden. You might think of somebody on the stage who is behind a curtain, and suddenly somebody pulls the curtain back, and you can see what is behind it, what is revealed. As we think about what is revealed, sometimes it takes for us to have a, a moment of crisis, a moment of awakening, to understand something of the truth of what our life is supposed to be about. It said that Alfred Noble, one morning, woke up to his coffee, and as he's sitting there in the morning, uh, drinking his coffee, he read the newspaper, and there on the front page it talked about his death, and said the father of dynamite has died. And so he was much, of course, uh, uh, awakened and, and uh, shocked by his own death, and realized that uh, of the paper, the thing that is said about his life, it was all about the fact that he had created dynamite. And he said, if that's the only thing that people know about my life, I am in trouble. And so he then posthumously had left everything in order to create the Nobel Foundation so that we might have the Nobel Prize and to award honors for phil philanthropic uh, endeavors because he wanted his name, Nobel, to be worth something more than dynamite so that the world might be changed by that. So it took him a moment of crisis of evaluating what is his life about? What's my life all about? The scriptures we read this morning on Epiphany Sunday are revealing a little bit about what is the life of the church to be about, and we're hearing the story from Paul in Ephesians. And he is starting off in Ephesians 3, and it's a sort of, and commentators will tell you that this section in Ephesians 3 is an excursion away from the main idea of where he's been at. Because he, he's been talking about God's grace and everything else, but here in the section of Ephesians, he starts talking about his own journey. He starts talking about how he had been called and chosen by God. And so as we look at the, uh, the notes this morning, I wanted to focus in on what it is that Paul understands of his own life as a way of helping us to understand who we are. See, Paul understands that he has received grace not only for himself, but also for others. In verse 2, he says, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. And what's interesting about that sentence is he's, of course, going to be talking about something people have known. They heard about how Paul, on his way to Damascus, in order to capture the Christians who were beginning to worship in the homes there, he had gone with letters from the synagogue that he might go and arrest the Christians and bring them to be persecuted and to be under judgment by the Sanhedrin, that is, the people who ran the temple courts. And as he had on his way to Damascus, had gone to capture the Christians, he was blinded by a light of Christ. And as he is laying on the ground, looking up at this light, he says, Who are you, Lord? And he hears the voice from heaven that says, Why do you persecute me, Paul? Why do you persecute me? And Paul understood that this was Jesus. And he hears the voice from God that says, I have chosen you to be an instrument of my grace. I have chosen you to be as a sword to those who would oppose my people. I have chosen you to be the one who would bring my good news to the Gentiles. Now that wasn't something Paul endeavored to do. He didn't start off in his life saying, I'm going to get knocked off my horse, of my arse, and, and then find out what my life is all about. But sometimes it does take for us to get to that moment where we do feel like we're laying on the ground, blinded by life, trying to figure out what life is about before we really get a vision for what God is calling us to do and be. And it doesn't always require for us to get totally knocked off our butt in order to figure that out, but often it does take us that moment of really self-reflecting, a time away from the continuous repetition and the business and season. And this is kind of a perfect time for this because if you, in the last month, have been a part of the Christmas season, if you've been a part of the New Year's celebration, you probably feel a little bit run out. Like there's been a lot of activities squished in together. 
And you're trying to figure out, when do I take a break and figure out what my life is really all about? It's good to take a pause, take a deep breath, and then go, okay, where is it that I'm going? What is all this busyness about? What does it mean? And so, in that verse 2, Paul puts it this way. He says, certainly you've heard about the way that God has given grace to me for you. And Paul understands that the blessing that he has received is not for himself. But it's also to be as given to others. He realizes first and foremost that it was God who chose him. And God who called him. God who chose him. And God who called him. We think about our own lives and we sometimes forget that God is actually like the shepherd who walks with us in the daily part of our journey. God calls us to be a part of his purpose. God created us not so that we could endeavor our own you know, dreams, but so that we might be a part of his work. Just the same way with Paul as he realizes that God had actually created him to be his instrument of good news to others. We recognize that God is the one who chooses. And secondly, that God uses Paul's past, and he uses Paul's failures. As Paul begins to be as a messenger to the Gentiles, we begin to recognize that Paul himself was somebody who was born not in Israel, but somebody who was born in a Roman stronghold. He grew up around Gentiles. He grew up in a Gentile area. But as he was growing up, he was surrounding himself by the Jewish law that said, you're to be separate from the Gentiles. And so what we recognize is that God had to do some interesting heart work for Paul in order for him to make that transformation, in order to do the work he had called him to do. Paul's passion for the Gentiles was not based on his own desire, but was based on a transformation of understanding of who God is, based on the love of God for all people. And once he finally understood that God truly loves all people, that is that for Paul, once God, he understood that God loved the Gentiles, then he realizes that he had a choice to make. He could either continue to do what he had been doing and separating himself away from the Gentiles and say, no, those are the sinners and the you know, unforgiven and the, the dirty ones, or my heart could be transformed in such a way that I'm going to extend the love of God to all. And Paul understood his role to be as an instrument for the Gentiles by God, to be an ambassador of love and peace, and so, God finally spoke to Paul, so that Paul understood that the Gentiles themselves are loved. And so, Paul began to love the Gentiles as well. So much so that at the end of Paul's ministry, when he comes back to Jerusalem to share about what he's been doing in his ministry, the Jewish people, who he had called his brothers and sisters, those who he had spent his time zealously protecting with the law, they sought after his life because they said, Paul, you continue to blaspheme God by hanging out with Gentiles and bringing Gentiles into the kingdom of God. That's not for them. But because of the transformation that Paul experienced, he was willing to even experience the ridicule from the religious elite so that he might do the work of God. Paul very clearly understood that he was blessed by God, not just for himself, but for someone else. Now, it's interesting we think about this work of God, of blessing our lives to be a blessing. We have to recognize that Paul uses our past. Who is it that we've been in connection with? Where is it that we grew up? Where are those stories and the histories that we've been connected with? God uses that to describe the work that he is going to do in our futures. The other piece of this is that God calls us to connect with a people. Ministry, believe it or not, it's all about relationships. It's all about people. Now, I remember when I was in seminary, I had a professor who said, and this is why he was a professor, he said, I would do ministry except for the people. They're kind of a mess. And I said, that's why you're a professor. But ministry is all about people. And as you know, people's lives are not straightforward. Our lives are a bit messy, you know, a little bit you know, untidy. We, we all make mistakes continuously. We have our ups and our downs. There's not like a straight line between here and heaven. There's often this circuitous route that goes up and down the highways and bodies of life. And the ministry is a walking alongside with a group of people to care for them in their lives. Paul clearly understood that his calling was to be with Gentiles. Now we understand that God's love is for all people. But for each one of us, there are a group of people, even a family circle, whom God has called us to love. 
that God has called us as an incubator of faith to explore ways that we might share God's love with that group of people. It could be with young people. It could be with old people. It could be with the down and out and downtrodden. It could be with the higher uh, echelons of society. But knowing who it is that God has called you to minister to is a part of how God has created us each to be in ministry. God has blessed us with His grace that we also might be ambassadors of that good news to others. The message isn't just for us. Just so we can be nice and, and figure out our own Christian lives, but rather that we can then share that good news with others. The second thing I think is interesting about what Paul is describing, he says that this work is something that is revealed. This is in verse 3. He says, this is the mystery that has been made known to me by revelation. We're talking about epiphany being a time of revelation. This is something that has been revealed. Now it's revealed, and it was previously unknown. That is, that those before Christ looked forward to seeing what God was up to. What is it that God is doing in the way of His activity in the world, and previously that had been unknown? But in Christ it has become known. And what's great is that it's described as this mystery. That there's this mystery of faith. What is God doing? It's this great mystery. We have no idea what that is. It's just a mystery. But here it is in Christ it is revealed, and it is made known by the work of the Holy Spirit that is given to the church. So we can understand what God is doing. We're not left, you know, I love how Jesus says to his disciples, I'm not going to leave you like orphans. I'm not going to abandon you. But rather I'm going to send my Holy Spirit so that you would understand and know what it is that God is about. Now what's true about this as well is that Jesus says you won't need anyone to instruct you for the Holy Spirit himself will bring to mind the very words that I have shared with you. So that you will know, you won't need anyone to instruct you because you will have the Holy Spirit who will be your teacher. We don't need to be lost or aimless, but rather the Holy Spirit has given to us this truth. What's great is to know that because it's been revealed by the Holy Spirit, it is not of human origin. You know, it's not the church sitting around in a dark room going, what are we going to do to create the church? What are we going to do to make sure that the church survives? What are we going to do to make sure we've got a good business plan? Believe it or not, that's not the way God operates. God doesn't wait for the church to figure itself out before God gives direction and leadership for the church. If it was that case, there would be no hope for the church. In a discussion with somebody not too long ago, there was this comment made that, you know, it is good that we are the church because as we work together, we survive. And I had to remind this person that it wasn't because we are so good that we work together that the church survives. It is because Jesus Christ is the Lord of the church that the church survives. And that Jesus, who really has a purpose and plan for the life of the church, that we're able to trust in Jesus Christ. And that if we place our trust and hope in Christ, then we recognize that the temporal concerns that we have as the church, i.e. our finances, i.e. our buildings, i.e. our population as the church, we recognize that those are secondary to the leadership of Christ. And if we're able to trust Christ, then we're able to see Christ's work in glorious fashion happen around us. Believe it or not, Peter, Paul, Jesus, the prophets, none of them had a building to work with. None of them had a financial budget structure. None of them had as much as we possibly have been given as the church. And yet, we see them as the great leaders for the church. If we're able to follow them as the ones who demonstrate for us what the church is about, can we place our trust in Christ, first and foremost? And not into our human decisions of how we do things. We can follow Christ alone. And I know some of you are like, but there is these concerns. And I understand. These are true concerns. But we can place them underneath the Lordship of Christ. And say, truly, if, Lord, if Jesus Christ is the Lord of the church, how does that affect the way we live our lives? So back to what is this mystery? Again, that mystery is that it has been made known to the apostles and the prophets, and that was described earlier on. But then again in verse 10, he says, this is made known his intention through the church. So we recognize that it has already been revealed, not just to Paul, but also then the apostles and the prophets, and then to the larger church. And it's a unique work that cannot be done with others. The work that God has given to the church to do cannot be done by Apple. 
The work that the church is, God has given to the church cannot be done by IBM or by the President of the United States or by any political organization. It can only be done by the church. Now some of you are going, what is that mystery? Well, the essence of our work is described this way. It is to give the, the sharing of the gospel, that which was hidden by God, his intention, this is in verse 10, his intention was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavens, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Jesus Christ. And so he's describing this mystery of what he is about. And this is in verse 6, he says that mystery is this, that through the gospel, Gentiles are heirs together through with Israel, members together of one body, shares together in the promise of Jesus Christ. So let me review that again, because in verse 6 he says, the mystery is this, that the gospel, through the gospel, Gentiles become members of God's family. That's going to be my summary. Through the gospel. So that gospel is what he's describing of the mystery, and the gospel is the sharing of who God is, God's love, to all people. So let's describe what that is. First, it is the fulfillment of what God has previously been doing. In generations past, as God has been working His covenant agreements with Abraham, with Isaac, with David, with Moses, those characters we've been looking at, we recognize that His work was always to covenant with a group of people that they might understand God and know God. And that God would say, you are my people and I am your God. But there was always this future hope that at some point this promise of God's covenant would not be isolated for a certain only one group of people, but it might be made known to the whole world. And so that fulfillment of the promises, we recognize it's not that there's something brand new, completely different than something else, but we see that God has continuously been calling people into his relationship with God. And now, through the church, we have the opportunity to say because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, all people are called into a relationship with God. All people are called into a relationship with God. This is God's work of redeeming all the world. That is to take away what was broken, what was in sin, what was enslaved to bondage and death. And all of that has been now transformed and redeemed by Christ. As the church, we have a message of good news. But it's not just words that we share, it is the truth of God who brings about love and transformation and power in our lives. The gospel message is the work of the church. There's a statement on the wall that said, keep the main thing the main thing. And for the, the main thing for the church is the good news of Jesus Christ. That through Him we have forgiveness of sins. Through Him we have become children of God. Through Him we have freedom and redemption. Through Him we have experienced the power and the love of God. We have a chance to share about the message of salvation. A world that is stuck in brokenness and bondage to sin is groping for a knowledge of the truth of how they might be free. And so I kind of laid them out in two columns for us to understand what we had previously experienced and to what we experienced in Christ. And previously we had experienced judgment, guilt, shame, recognizing our sin and our brokenness, but now in Christ we are forgiven. Previously we had not been a people, a people scattered across the earth with no sense of truth or identity, but rather now in Christ we are God's chosen people, beloved by Him. Previously we had no position before God. We were not able to stand before God because of our sin. But now Paul describes that in Christ we now have confidence before God. We wonder if God is angry with you. Now we know that because of what Christ has done for us, we can stand before God as His chosen people. Previously, we have been in bondage and brokenness. Now we experience true freedom. Freedom to live as God has called us to be. We are no longer in bondage to sin that so easily desires to grip our lives. But now because of the power of Christ, we are able to be freed from that. We've previously been slaves to the world, but now we are heirs of God, children of God. Previously we had been weakened in our flesh, but now we have the power of God on our side. Previously we have been ignorant of God, but now there is the wisdom of God for those who believe. All of what we have received here is God's grace, freely given, 
freely given so that we might then share that with others. This work of sharing this good news is given for the church. It's not something anybody else can do. It is the message exclusively for the church. It is the unique work of the church. No one else can do that work. We wonder sometimes what it is we have that the rest of the world needs. And as we describe that, I ask the question, do you know anyone who finds themselves struggling with life? Do you know anyone who feels as if life has no purpose or meaning? Do you know anyone who continues to find themselves beating their head against the wall because they continue to find themselves in the same failures and destructive patterns of behavior? If you know any of those persons and you know those of yourself, then you know that the message of the salvation of the gospel of Jesus Christ has meaning for our lives. And this is the work of the church, that we might share that good news. This is why it's stated that for the Methodist Church, our mission statement is that we might make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The whole purpose of this is that we might help others know of the love of God, the gospel of God, so that they might experience His love and forgiveness. The forgiveness that is only available in heaven. The bishop has shared with us a, a video and some slides that we're going to walk through here. Because as we talk about this Epiphany Sunday, this is an opportunity, an evaluation time for us. To get down to the core of it, of what it is that we're called to be about as a church. And so as we look at this, uh, the slides the bishop has shared with us, she's talking about a time, a day of discernment. And this being that day of discernment, not the video itself, but the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And we talked about that just a second ago. We recognize that local churches, and this is the description of our Methodist Book of Discipline, local churches provide the most significant arena through which the disciple-making process happens. I don't know if you recognize that, but this has been our focus as the church, is to help people learn about who Christ is and to grow in their faith. The local church is the most significant arena in which that can happen. As a people of the Methodist Church, God is calling us to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. That is, that we are called to be a light of the world. A light in the midst of the darkness. Now it is called for us to have a time of prayerful discernment. Where is it that, who is it that God has called us to reach? Where is it that we feel God is leading the church? And in this prayerful discernment of God's vision for us, it's criti critical to our faithfulness to be able to evaluate where we are. So it will take all of us listening to God's voice to know where God is leading us. I'm going to share with you now a little video that has been given to us that we might hear from our bishop together. Brothers and sisters, greetings to you in this season of Epiphany. May the light of Christ Jesus shine upon you. We are at a wonderful moment in our life together as members of the California Pacific Conference. God is calling us forth to even greater opportunities as disciples of Jesus the Christ. I know you want to follow Jesus with all of your hearts and your best efforts. I believe that God has a mission for us that will take the good work of all of us, transforming the world through God's grace and inviting others to join us as disciples of Jesus is a blessed and exciting journey we don't want anyone to miss out on. On this day, we seek your prayerful engagement. Help us discern where God is calling us by sharing your thoughts, your hopes, and your dreams as we strive to be the people of the United Methodist Church. Thanks for sharing. Most of all, I'm so very grateful to God for your faithfulness to Christ Jesus. God be with you and bless you. I'm glad that worked. My impression of the bishop is not as good as it could be. <laughs> but what we're going to be doing is that in your uh, bulletin, there was a handout, and it was just three questions. We're going to take the next uh, seven, eight minutes to have you just kind of carefully consider those three questions together. And those three questions are, who is Jesus Christ to you? Secondly, my walk with Jesus could be immeasurably improved if the church would only, and fill in that blank. And then lastly, what is your hope for today? 
and for future generations. What would be some of your hopes? So we're going to begin with prayer, and then I'm going to invite you to prayerfully consider those three questions, and then as we finish those questions, uh, we'll have a chance to collect those and then take the offering together. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your continued work in your church, and as we prayerfully consider these questions that are before us, as a measure of discipleship, a measure of discernment, but help us to be faithful as your people. In Christ we pray. Amen.